Doesn't it feel great? Before you were with the person. I don't know, love does something weird with time, doesn't it? Like everyone's quiet because you're like, <laughs> <laughs> so great. Before you're with the person, you can't wait to be with them. Time's really slow before you're with them. And then when you're with them, it's weird. Time seems to speed up. It was like a two hour walk in the woods or something, and it went by like a flash. And then when you're done with them, you just can't wait to be with them again. It's like a, you're, you're magnificent when you're in love, aren't you? The poet Pablo Neruda said, love does to a person what spring does to a cherry tree. Mm. <sighs> you blossom when you're in love. You flourish. If you think about what you're like when you're in love, you're productive, you're invigorated, you're innovative, you're collaborative, you're generous, you're resilient. All of those things when you're in love. Okay, take those adjectives. Isn't that exactly what your CEO wants? They want you to be. The CEO wants you to be productive and creative and innovative and invigorated and resilient and generous and collaborative. Isn't that what, isn't that what every CEO wants you to be? Well, you, yes, is the answer, of course. And, and you don't get any of those things by just writing them on a wall, do you? I don't know about you, but I'm so darn sick and tired of organizations taking real human words and imagining that they've therefore created real human feelings. If you want people to feel innovative and collaborative and resilient and passionate and all those things, I mean, for crying out loud, we have doctors right now with no resilience. We're going to face a 20 to 25,000 physician shortage because doctors and nurses are experiencing levels of PTSD higher than combat vets. We've got a resilience issue, and yet we talk about it in terms of like discretionary effort or motivated or even engaged. And it's like, no, the raw material for productive, creative, innovative, resilient, generous, open. The raw material is love. This isn't some soft, squishy thing. If we're going to talk about talent development without using the word love, we should just stop it. Because if you want to release talent, you've got to get in and you've got to engage with the language of love. You do, because that's a real, genuine, non-watered down, non-academic, non-theoretical, free-thinking, student of excellence approach to talent. You bump into the word love really quickly. Now, some of you may still go, well, look, all right, but I can't, I mean, look, I'm busy. Everyone's busy. I can't, do, I, can't, I can't make my I love what I do. What does that even mean? You can, though. You can not necessarily do what you love. You can find love in what you do. You can. It's a skill. You can do it. Here's how. Think of the most productive and effective person you know. Just think of the most productive and effective person you know. I don't mean money-wise, necessarily. I mean just someone you go, God, she or he is flourishing. Where you go? When you think of them, don't you go, God, you're so lucky. How did you find that job? How did you find that life? It just seems to fit you as a manifestation of you. You're so lucky. How did you find that? I wish I could, I wish I could find that. And yet that's the wrong verb, isn't it? They didn't find it. They made it. They took a generic job description. And then they figured out what was the best of the job. And then deliberately, gradually, selfishly, they took the best of their job and turned it into most of their job. We can all do this. We've asked this question of 18 nations around the world. Do you have the freedom to modify your job to fit yourself better? And 73% of us agree or strongly agree that we can. According to the Gallup engagement data, only 18% of us, though, say that we do have a job that plays to the best of us. So 18% of us actually do it, 73% of us feel that we can. In sociology, we call that an attitude, or rather an attitude behavior consistency problem. So how do you remove the problem? Most of us think we can do this. How do you do it? I'm going to share in the last sort of eight minutes here a way to do this. You've never done this. It's free. You can do this. Spend a week in love with your job. When you're helping someone else develop their talent, tell them to do this. Spend a week in love with your job. It's a strange phrase, isn't it? Spend a week in love with your job. Here's what it looks like. Take a blank pad around with you for a week. Draw a line down the middle of it. Put loved it at the top of one column and loathed it at the top of the other column. And then go around with yourself for a week. And any time you see one of the signs of love before you did the activity, you couldn't wait to. While you were doing it, time was just sped up and you were in flow. When you were done with it, you couldn't wait to do it. Maybe you were not ready to do it again right away, but you weren't drained. You were like, I'm 
And so you're good at it, you, you, you lean into it, time flies by. Anytime you see an activity like that, scribble it down in the lovely column. And anytime you find something the inverse, before you do it, you procrastinate it, or you try to hand it off to the new guy, because it'll be developmental. Or while, <laughs> while you're doing it, time slows down, and it's five minutes for five hours. Scribble it down in the loaf. So you'll end up with a week with a bunch of loved it and loved it. A bunch of other activities won't make either list, but you'll have on your list of loved it some activities that are different for you. Think of these as your red threads. Your work at work is made up a lot of different activities. Some of them are great, some of them are frayed, but some of them are made of red. Some of them are made of different material. You have ability, you have appetite. They invigorate you. These are your red threads. The Mayo Clinic has done research that shows that if you can weave 20% of your job with these red threads, every time you go below 20%, one percentage drop in the time you spend weaving a red thread, you get a 1% increase in likelihood of burnout. There's a direct linear negative correlation. So you don't need to take a red thread and weave an entirely red fabric. You don't need to do what you love. But if you take these red threads yourself and weave them into, as Tara called it, the fabric of your work, even if you have 20% red threads, you're a different human. Think of those threads as your strengths. Now I know we think of a strength as what you're good at and a weakness as what you're bad at. But that's not actually the right definition, is it? Because don't you have all, so all of us have some things we're good at that we hate? What do you call that? Well, you're really good at it, but if you never had to do it again, it would be a day too soon. What do you call that? I would suggest you call that a weakness. A weakness is any activity that weakens you, a frayed thread, even if you're good at it. A strength is what strengthens you, and you know. You know what your strengths are better than anybody else does. Your manager or your team leader, he or she might know your performance. Performance is what you're good at. Bad performance is what you're bad at. And he or she might be able to judge that. So if you do this, this weakened love with your job, and you find that one of the love jets was finding patterns in data, maybe you're like summer, finding patterns in data, here's what your team leader can say. She can say, well, so you're, not, you're not sharing the patterns well enough. You're not explaining clearly enough what they are. You're not finding the right patterns. She can say all that. But here's what she can't say. She can't say, no, you don't. You don't love that at all. <laughs> Only you know what strengthens you. You might not be contributing it yet intelligently, but you know what strengthens you better than anybody else does. No one knows your red threads but you. No one. And it's not a function of your gender or your race or your age or your nationality. How do we know this? Because raise your hands if you have a sibling. <laughs> okay, get your siblings in mind for a minute. Aren't they weird? <laughs> I have an elder brother and a younger sister. I mean, they're not weird. But isn't it weird how different they are from you? I mean, these people know you best. They were born and raised in the same family and same mom, same dad. At least that's what you were told. And they grew up. And, and, and yet they're so different. They feel so close to you, but they also and sometimes feel so annoying to you, don't they? And so different from you. My brother and my sister, my elder brother, super musical composer. My sister was a ballet dancer, professional ballet dancer for 20 years. I seem to have some sort of musical ectomy at birth. <coughs> my whole musical genes removed really early. No one knew this to start with. They gave me a trombone really early and said, it's an instrument. And I used it like a weapon. <laughs> so like, it's, not a, it's not a sword, Marcus. It's a slide trombone. It's a slide. But I have, I, I have no musical talent at all. Everyone is so different. You are so different from your siblings. You know what your red threads are better than anyone else does. And when you don't find them, when you don't pay attention to them, the world won't help you. The world doesn't care what your red threads are. The world is really busy. The world doesn't care what your red threads are. And when you don't know where you get strength from, when you do not know what strengthens you at work, I'm not saying work is the only place to discover your red threads, by the way, life can, but work is a great place to discover what invigorates you. When you don't, you feel weaker and weaker. And as President Obama said yesterday, when you get into that frame of mind where you don't know who you are as a human, you start getting into us and them. In sociology, we call that amity within, enmity without. You start joining up to groups who look and think like you, because you go, I don't know who I am, except I'm not you. Well, we 
have a lot of that going on right now. We are frightened as a world because we don't know who we are as individuals. And rather like with spring, it just makes the love makes you flourish and so generous and open. Boy, when you don't have your red threads, you are a different human and you're scared and we get a lot of that. What we are trying to do here as talent professionals is we are trying to help people to find their red threads. Yes, so that we can build better teams. Yes, so we can build better organizations and companies. But also, and I don't think I'm overstating this, so that we can build a better world. A world that is more generous. Yes? Yes, right? A world that is more generous, more open, more collaborative. But it starts not at the level of politics, not at the level of sociology, it starts at the level of psychology. We are helping each person to find their red threads. I wear this red thread simply to, as, a, as, a, as a reminder, and we'll give these away for those of you that want to do the same thing at the bookstore. This is a reminder, the only person who knows and can take responsibility for finding my red threads in life is me. And the same is true for you, and the same is true for your siblings, and the same is true for your children. There are certain things in life that invigorate you. Your life is speaking to you in a language that only you understand. You've got to listen, because no one else will. And you do this not just to be more resilient and more creative, not just because you'll feel like you flourish, though you will, but because we want you to contribute. Because love is the precursor to contribution. This isn't about selfishness, it's about giving.